Let me tell you what we have planned with Nicolas for you. We are going to have a first module where I am going to give you some uh, theoretical background. And although you will see that I have many slides, well, there are not so many, a decent number of slides. I'm going to show them quite fast. The idea is that you already know many things, so it doesn't make much sense uh, to spend too long uh, with it. But the idea is that to, to make sure that we are speaking the same language, because now Nicolas is going to start the second module, and there, indeed, we are going to, it's going to be a hands-on activity. We are human. Human beings have a need to name things. So we, we name everything, the dog, the fish, the parrot, each stone. We even name things that already have names. For instance, when uh, uh, and uh, when they invent a new name. So, so we also tend to put names to uh, computers. So, and uh, the names are the host names. And, and uh, very often they start having semantics and meanings that go beyond just to uh, uh, tell them apart from uh, the uh, neighbors. So in the early 70s, people saw the need to integrate the names in a way to the way to the operations of the network. So they saw the need for a, a directory of there. It's like a, a telephone book. I don't know whether they still publish it, but at the time when people used the telephones, uh, the landlines, it was common to have the names of the people in alphabetical order and their telephone numbers of their landlines. So, What's the interesting thing about the directories? They are not reversible, so it's very easy to look for one direction, but not the other way around. So if you know the name of the person, you can look at it in alphabetical order and find uh, the, 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 the number, telephone number, but not the other way around. If you have the telephone number, you don't know whose it is. So the uh, internet uh, directory service has a tree structure. And the reason why it is important um, is because of what we are going to discuss now. What is DNS? And so we need to put names to people, to, to things, and they're important because they enable us to work uh, more easily. So we have this internet protocol that uses numbers. Um, so it's it's interesting to match people and numbers. From the inception of the internet, they developed directories with a host. Here you have a 1974 document. These, uh, this is 1974. This is the internet that used the NCP, another protocol that says, host address, and for practical purposes, it's like today's. Look at the similarity of this image here to your left. Here, host names, how it's very similar to this, to the telephone book, almost the same thing. It's the internet. Uh, book instead. This was the internet host table, and it's even uh, described in uh, RFC 952 that states how they handle it. Uh, so, and there you, so you see that this existed uh, even at the beginning of the internet. Now, distributing that, uh, uh, that it's a it's a file that was uh, transmitted and it's inexpensive for many reasons. Well, it's cumbersome to copy it. And you, you have to request someone to discharge you so that you can download the file. So 
what are the requirements to have a good directory service of the internet? First of all, to maintain the organizations independent so that each may create their names. We may have a, a, a page where we can put our names and to have an efficient distribution mechanism. The mechanism, the host table, was cumbersome to copy the file, but after you had copied it, the performance of the search was very good because you had cached all the names. So the concept of the cache will appear in the DNS. We need a way we can represent the names, that is the registries, the names, the, uh, the numbers are going to have the semantics because you're going to publish the services. And just as in the telephone book, the internet telephone uh, uh, book will have, um, in one way it's going to be very efficient, but the other way it's going to be very cumbersome. So you have number and then uh, the IPv4, IPv6 address and na or name, uh, the mail server and uh, the DNS server, that is what we know as the delegation. The DNS zones are the pages in uh, the internet uh, book where each organization can register their interests. This uh, tree structure will show uh, something that we will all agree with. The only thing that all the DNSs agree upon is in the root. We use one single root. That is about the only thing that uh, all of, we all know and that we all agree upon. And we agreed upon when we started working with this. This is the structure of a domain name. Remember that these are tags separated by dot. Some have peculiar names such as dot UY. That's a CCTLD, that's a country. Uh, code top level domain, the CCTLD. So it's um, uh, the GTLDs are the generic TL top level domains. And there you have the dot com, dot net, dot edu, etc. And you have a list of new TLDs such as Ninja, Black. There are about 1200. In the domain names, you have the rules. Sometimes we don't write it down. Sometimes we do have to write it down. Nicolas will discuss that in the second uh, part. When you have to write it, you have to write it because if not, it won't work. The zone, what is a zone? It's that page of the directory where each uh, organization may write their registries. And the zones are related to a more uh, ethereal uh, thing, that is the authority. The, the zone belongs to an organization. So somebody in the internet, when we, somebody is servers, some server needs to have the authority to respond for that zone. The concept of authority is the delegation of that capacity to write in a page of the directory. How do you implement it? From an upper level, you dele delegate the zone in my servers. So the zone will be hosted in authoritative servers. The NS uh, uh, registry in the parent zone will make it possible for me to signal to the rest of the internet that there is an area under a zone under my zone. Here, many people get mixed with the primary and secondary server and the authority. All the servers or an authoritative server, some of them are going to be primary and the other are going, the others are going to be secondary. But for the purpose of the internet, all of them will be authoritative. The primaries, when you have the sonar file where we edit and create the registers and the secondary, are the ones that are copied to, for the sake of redundancy. The registries or the resource records, the RR, you're going to see the RR many times in the presentation, are those things that we have in the database. Um, the most important here is there are three things. Although there are five fields 
you just have to remember three, the name, the value, and the type. The name is the tag, uh, such as, uh, and the, the, such as WWLACNIC, the type is uh, uh, X, et cetera. It's a semantic for the name and the value is entering into the database. So what you see is www.lacnic.net type A value 203, 14, 184. You see this, it is semantic uh, version. Um, and now I'll switch to the terminal to show you a command. If I do, for instance, register mx of lacnic.net what i'll have here is the name lacnicnet a type mx and a value that's actually two things it's a number and another tag if i ask other things for instance for a like this when i have for a quadruple A, I, then I have the here, I have, and the value, and so on. So for as the DNS as a database, the type is an additional element in the database. The semantic is we put it to the uh, client, the browsers, the mail servers put the semantics. So the mail servers ask for MX and the, uh, the browsers for the quadruple A, so there are many types. The oldest are the more, most generic, as I'm showing, and the most recent are more esoteric, but they make sense in the internet as we know it today. For instance, there are registries for uh, um, uh, IP, um, for, for instance, to find service uh, localizers, um, uh, location. The SOA registry is interesting. It is the registro SOA of the zona LACNIC-NET. This is SOA LACNIC of the LACNIC registry. There's one for every zone all those this is start of authority and it defines a series of timers of a zone that are important one is a zero this is a number that increases whenever there's a change in the zone and then there's a series of timers that are interesting because this has to do with the controls with the secondary ones and how much should be controlled by a secondary one if the primary one fails so they have some important things when controlling the zone and the relation of the zone with the secondary ones. These two fields up here where you have ns.lacnic.net, this should be the primary DNS server. They are all authoritative. And this here, this is not used so much, but this is a mail address of the manager for the zone. And the first dot should be an at, not a dot. So it's hostmaster at blacknick.net. So the SOA is important. All the zones have this. And this is interesting because when you don't know what to ask for, for a zone, you have to ask for the SOA. So that is the point on the resources. So how do we look up this, look this up in the DNS? How do we look things up in a telephone directory? There are some things we're all aware of in a telephone directory, and this is how it is organized. That is the main point, which we base ourselves on when we look something up in the telephone directory. So how this is organized there, this is an alphabetical order by a last name. This is a convention. I mean, it can be whatever you wish. It should be efficient, but you can define this. 
in the case of the DNS, we have the same situation. This is not in alphabetical order, of course, but this there is some order, and we all agree in respecting that organization. That organization is given by the tree structure. The tree, as a structure, imposes an order, and the order is that the tree, we know it has a root, and we can start doing things on the root, which is what we know exists. The root will contain a level below it, and other levels below it further can have yet other ones. We know there is an organization in this direction, top down, or from the root to the leaves, or whichever way. So one could establish an organization within the same level. For example, in DNS, we don't do this because it is not necessary. So what does the tree offer us? We have a structure we all agree on. And this is the structure where we all know where to start looking things up. What is the key information that links one level to the next? This is what we call delegations. And we see this through these records, through the DNS records. Under the LACNIC.net, there is a zone called LAS. Dot .lacnic dot net. We do this for the purpose of experiments. So how do I know as an internet server if this zone exists? I can ask. And who do I ask? I ask the DNS servers of lacnic.net. Here I have the answers. It, there is an authority section in these three records. I know that down here there is something which is the labs zone of LACNIC.net. This is a convention. This is part of the low protocol. But the key point is that we all agree on something. And the key issue is that we all share the information on the root zone. It's like an uh, agreement we have made in uh, using the same route. This is where the DNS deals with the more political issues of the internet governance. This is still a convention. It couldn't have alternative routes. But for the work functioning of internet, we agree on this uh, sort of social contract of using the same DNS route. So how does this work? This is what we call recursive resolution. So I will, as a client, I want to have the quad A solution of LACNIT.net. Down here, you have the end of the story, which is what I showed you a while ago. How does this work? The client only knows that the DNS and is, is going to ask the root for the quad A of www.dark.net. And the root will say, I don't know what that is. But I do know where the authoritative uh, servers are of .net. I'm going to ask once again, what is the quad A of lacnic.net? And I, the answer is going to be, I don't know what lacnic.net is, but I know where the lacnic.net lives. So it ends up asking the authoritative part for LACNIC.net, and then I will receive the final answer. So I have a video here. I hope you will be able to see it. It only lasts 40 seconds. It's only 40 seconds. I ask the root server I for www.lacnic.net, and it tells me they don't know, but they know which the, the G GLDs are. So I repeat the question. And what will happen? The answer is, I don't know what it is, but I know where the servers are. So what I do now is I repeat the question. I'm always asking the same thing. And I select just any. 
And I reach the end of that recursive process, that recursive resolution, which is what we just did. There is a question from Sergio. When I do a query for a name and they have a record which is A and quad A, do you get the two back in the same answer? No. There might be some case that we should go into the additional zone to see if it answers that, but I hadn't considered speaking about that at all. But we can comment it later on. But the answer would be no, because A and quad A records are different. If I ask for type A, it's one answer. If I ask for quad A, then the answer is different. But we have the additional section. I'm going to speak about the sections now. And in the additional section, a DNS server, which is smart, will guess that the client is interested in this. And But I'll, I'll go into the details later. Now, how does all this work together? For example, to see a website, Google, well, you all know this. As a client, I ask the recursive local server for www.google.com. The server will find the authoritative of google.com. I will get back the address, and then I can open the browser and see this here. An important thing, and here we have the issue of the cache, is that the second time I ask the DNS server for google.com, it won't do a recursive it's going to return it through the cache. It's not an authoritative response. The response of the cache is the one that is authoritative. The response of these three, one is primary and the other two are secondary. These are always authoritative answers. The protocol, DNS protocol. How is this transformed into packets in order to inform us? Let us not lose sight of the fact that what I have explain so now our data and tree structures and databases now i have to express this in packets because ultimately in the internet someone has to really express this in bytes and packets the dns protocol in my opinion has one of the mechanisms of expressing this in bytes and packets that is one of the best of all. And this has to do with the following. This protocol was conceived as being expandable. How can this be expressed? Well, the DNS protocol is divided into two fields. One is an abstract model, which is a high level representation of the DNS protocol, and then a whole series of rules or transformations that I can write out I can write out that abstract model in a string of bytes. Those who are familiar with SNMP, SNMP, this is something that might sound familiar to you. So the DNS protocol is something you have to imagine as follows. It's a box with subdivisions. You know, like those boxes with subdivisions, and in each section of that box, I have papers, and each paper has a record. Each second, except for the header, each of these sections, the one question, the one answer, the one authority, the one additional, are all lists of registries. The header section is different. It doesn't have any registry. It has a series of flags for control, and then one which is query ID. But the others, the, the header is often called a pseudo section. The others are just lists of resources. So question is what I include. My question answers where you receive the replies. Authority is where you do the recursions. You know what I did just now? The video, as I follow the recursions, the information of the DNS is, is given in the authorities part. And the additional section is the one I also referred to a while ago, which is one that 
doesn't have a fully defined behavior and largely depends on the service. The idea of the additional section is to save me from doing lookups when I ask for a DNS and I get back a name and I do additional query on that name, then the additional section saves me this job because they report this back. But I can also receive other things. Flag A is interesting. This is for authoritative answers. Does it have to do with recursive uh, answers? Are the flags tell me when there are errors? So the protocol might have some error conditions when a zone is corrupt, for example, or when a name does not exist. Very often, this is called wire protocol, namely the set of rules that allow us to represent this abstraction in bytes. Transport, once I have the string of bytes, I have to include it somewhere so I can transmit this packet. This something will have IP, but it has to have something else. This something else could be UDP or TCP. In UDP, this is practically in overhead, rather port number, but there is no organization there, nor can we link an outgoing packet with the answer. So that is why we have the query ID. If we have the query ID, my client can say, well, this is my query 150, and the server will respect. He will say, this is the answer to your question number 150. What else does the UDP have? It doesn't have fragmentation. It doesn't have the capacity to do fragmentation. UDP is reassembled and is always the same one. That is why it has a maximum size, and which is not so big. In the mid 80s, this protocol defined a packet size of a maximum of 512 bytes. This is the reason why there are only 13 routes. Originally, all the routes had to fit into the same packet. And although this mutated over time, this is a convention that is still maintained. In fact, as a result of the Anycast, there is no point in this evolving now. Then we have the possibility of expanding the UDPs, but there is a maximum size. The TC flag, which comes from truncated, allows my server to tell my client that the answer is truncated. This means that the world more information on this. What is the expected behavior of a client that receives a flag TC, a TC flag, is to re-attempt to do the same question on TCP where I do not have the limit of the maximum size. Through TCP, I can send whatever I wish. Why do I prefer TCP? I, I have to pay not money, but if you have a lot of queries, you end up paying money. But you have to pay two round trips, one there and one back, in order to transmit something that is useful. There is a lot of overhead in terms of time in order to finally obtain something useful. That is why UDP is preferred. Remember that TCP implies having a buffer and other issues. So TCP is there. It is important. We have to use it. But it's better not to use it. This is a traditional DS, DNS. I want to dedicate at least a couple of seconds to this. This has to do with the new DNS transports. Some have been defined recently. You probably heard about this recently. We have DOT and DOH. 
DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS. So the zones contain information that are, is natural, are natural public. The idea is to protect what each one of us as individuals consult the DNS for. DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS, it's, uh, it's, it's not as frequent. It sounds uh, strange, uh, stranger, but uh, there, those are two things uh, that uh, uh, can be used and uh, both force the use of TCP and they uh, imply uh, coding. So they are more expensive way. Vulnerabilities. Here. So this is, um, I want you to show you this, but uh, you'll have these slides because I'm going to show it very quickly. This is a very classical vulnerability of the DNS, but it's sort of a template of the vulnerabilities. Here, this is uh, a story that has to do with the origins of DNS. It's uh, DNS is over 40 years old and almost unchanged just by adding uh, registries or enlarging some things. But basically, the protocol is the same as in the 80s. So it, it makes sense that it, things may happen, that it has vulnerabilities. You have to know them and be familiar with them and understand them. And I think that it, the internet will never be a completed work. It will, it's always work in progress. You always have to adapt it to the new times, either because of security, but also because of the service uh, uh, services that uh, the users want to use it for. So some people may say, oh, but this uh, cache poisoning has been studied a lot. But what I'm going to show you now is absolutely uh, illustrates uh, the template of all the vulnerabilities. And it has to do with behavior. Imagine that I want to open uh, the website of Laknaga. So there's a recursive uh, resource, and then there's an authoritative for Laknaga.org. So this is the answer that you have, 2001, DB8, CAFE123, uh, and then we have uh, the happy users that find the website of Laknog and they see that he's smiling. This is the normal operation. So this is what you know. Now, look at this. Somebody malicious appears. So there we have the icon of the biohazard. And it has an address that is 2001 DB8 dead 666. That is the demons um, number. And then we have the recursive and the authoritative. Uh, now, look at what uh, the virus will do. The gray queries are valid, they are legitimate. What is the IP for www.lacnac.org? In parallel, the virus will inject packages, say, DNS packages saying that are spoof spoofers that are put together as if it were an authoritative response of the DNS and it says the NS authoritative the authoritative NS of Lacnog is 2001 DB8 dead why does this happen because the DNS use uses DNP and DNP is easy to change because you don't have control of the sequences or the flow what is the only obstacle between the spoofing and success two things all those sequence numbers involved there, of course, in IP, it's only two, the port numbers of origin and the query ID. The two numbers have 16 digits. Those numbers, for the sake of the queries and answers, are 32. We can think of it as 32 bits, but you see that the space gets much smaller and the space is finally much smaller. So the attacker sends these packages spoofing 
attacks this server. Remember that when he received this question, the recursive asked the true authoritative that question. Now, under some circumstances, if the attacker, if I generate a number big enough of these packages, sooner or later, I will hit the proper one. That, and uh, as, uh, as soon as I do that, I will poison the cache because the next user that comes and asks will have see this result. They'll see a page, a website that is not the right one, even though you may be putting the right name, he is being redirected to a different website. I didn't realize that of putting HTTPS because some people may say that HTTPS is, uh, protects you from that, but it doesn't. Because if I'm an attacker and I'm hosting this web, this false, fake website, I can also generate something sophisticated for that. So for practical purposes, this person won't realize that the certificate is different unless it's a very sophisticated user that looks at the IP and all the, the features of the certificate. So if any of you tell me that you do it, I won't believe it. And, and I don't think that it would be a, a wise thing to do it. In. Um, and this is how DNSSEC appears for the first time. How can we protect from this? This is a risk uh, that is uh, rather large. There's an attack. If, if you look for a researcher, Daniel Kaminsky, you see that there are techniques uh, to prune the uh, tree of 32 bits with quite modest uh, bandwidth. Uh, and this attack can be done in just a few hours. Think that the attacker, usually it, it's a mass attack. It's not targeted. It's not that I want to poison the DNS response of the CEO. No, it's all of the uh, IXP customers. I want to poison at least 1% of all of them. So I'll be able to steal a lot of things. So doing this is is possible. So it, it it's important to protect ourselves from that. The DNSSEC will protect us from other things, but think of that vulnerability scenario. So what is DNSSEC? If you say that it's a new protocol, you're wrong. DNSSEC is a set of expansions to DNS that is very, with great ingenuity, but it is not new at all. It's adding new rows or new functions to the DNS. And how do we extend the DNS? Essentially by adding types of registry with specific semantics. And then by adding things that are not in packages, but that are part of the protocol that are behaviors uh, at uh, the server and the client. The registries are these, DNS key, RRSIG, and NSNSEC. And finally, one that is essential, that is the DS registry. The DNS key is a, a public key, a cryptographic key. RRSIG is a digital uh, signature. NSSEC, NSSEC uh, is, a, it, it's not complex, but it requires some explanation. We don't have much time, so I'm going to skip it. And the DS registry is a, um, a rem, uh, an SSEC, uh, it's, it's similar to NSSEC. I can delegate to the following. The, the DS enables me to assure them. It's a sort of a, a padlock that ensures that the delegations are valid. So the extensions to the protocol, this is here we see the extension of the maximum length of 512, 4096. So we, if 
we would be forcing all the questions of the DNS sec and we, we don't want to do that. You all also need to add some flags. Remember that now the protocol has the validation as an additional feature. And it is good to know the result of the validation because that's the reason why we do it. The types of resources, DNSSEC, will introduce digital signatures. Those digital signatures are the result of a mathematic, uh, uh, a mathematic uh, formula involving public and private uh, keys. And the result is published in the DNS zone. What I'm going to have is something like this. I will have a name, a value, and a signature. Remember that when I did uh, DNS queries, mostly I had this. Now I will have this at the bottom. The two things will appear when I um, uh, send a DNS query. And now I'm going to show you a different thing. The why do I sign? What's the purpose? Because I can verify it. It's just like signing a document. Because if the public and the private keys are separate and the uh, private are confidential, an external observer may repeat uh, the uh, uh, arithmetic that led me to the signature and compare it to what uh, they're seeing in the internet. And in so if the two agree, then I can be certain that the signature is valid, and if they don't, something failed. The idea is to be able to do something that will only uh, to, um, that uh, to produce something that I'll be certain that can only be done by a human being. Digital signatures, verification of signatures, and here the uh, trust chain. This is essential. This is very important. Uh, um, the DNSSEC, as I told you, notice that I have the registries and the signatures. They all come as a uh, result of the same uh, query, for instance, uh, the registry A, etc., etc., and then no all plus answer. Where do I get the public key from? I get it from a query like this one. So I ask the DNS for their public key. So what happens? Think of this uh, for a second. I have the registry, the signature that I need to check, and the key that I need to use to check it, all of them in the same DNS query. So what's the problem there? If an attacker were to take over my control and uh, may, may alter everything, the registries and the key. So there's, it will validate even if it's not valid. So that's why we have this chain of trust. It's just like the same thing as the chain, chain of trust in the certificates. And it has to do with the following. The DNS key registries in each zone and the delegations. Remember that the delegations uh, materialize in the DNS registry. Here, in the parent zone, just as in the parent zone, I have a DNS registry that materializes in the, the parent 
stone, I will have a DNS that says, that's okay, the key that was used to sign this is here. So I go here to see the key that was used for that zone. So it's a sort of a signature of this, just of the DNS key. When I check the signature, I take the DNS key and I check that it matches with the DNS. Now, how do I verify the DNS? Just the same. I, I validate this because the DNS is in this zone that is signed and I can validate. And then I have the same problem. I have to ver verify this. And how do I do it? By checking the route. And what happens here? How do I go? I can't go any further because the root has no parents. The root exists. It's like the Big Bang in the universe. How do I do that? Well, the parent zone, the root zone, is a special root. It's a parent root. It has a signature and a, a DS uh, registry that is distributed outside of the band, just as the IPs are distributed outside the band. And the uh, um, and I get a, a file, a text file saying what uh, uh, the root is. Here I have an example that I was produced with DN, uh, DNS this. this. You, it's a tool that you use. You will use constantly because it enables you to identify all the things that you did wrong. And there are many things that typically one uh, makes mistake with. And uh, it's a normal thing. That's how we learn. That is why the DNS viz is a remarkable tool. So when you enter this URL, you'll see something like this. You'll see a number of boxes. Each box is a zone. This is. Um, the root and inside each box you have these oval uh, shapes that are DNS registries. And here it says that this registry signs this and this with this key. And this one signs this, this DS. And what happens later? It goes over to the org area. It's goes to these keys here, which sign a DS. Then they sign in the LACNOC org, and here we have a key that signs all these registries, all these here. Now, look at this here, at this part here, how the chain of trust is exactly that. It is a chain of things that are signed and then can be verified one after the other. I already mentioned about the resigning the root, signing the root. Some key points when before we finish. Remember what DNS is and what problem it is solving, how we name things. Remember the architecture. Remember why this tree shape structure is so important. It allows us to look things up efficiently. Remember the reg records. Remember the zone the zones, and remember the role of delegation in transferring the authority. Remember what authoritative and recursive is, and also remember what DNSSEC is and how this works. There are digital signatures, there are keys, there is delegation that is signed, etc. And here, almost out of breath, I'm over. I have three minutes left, and I think we can go over to the questions. Nico, do we have any questions? No. The questions that came up, we answered online, but I can read out a couple of questions that were asked. So basically, the questions, Sergio asked a couple of questions on the A record and quad A 
records if we wish to access a server with IP4, IP6 to a given road server, if they should do the query for the two A or quad A. As I mentioned earlier, if the A queries answered for A and quad A. Well, it's so a bit difficult to reproduce that, but let me try. Let me give it a try as follows. Let us do the query to the LACNIC server. I don't remember if these are disabled or not, but we can use the any. In the any, you can receive anything. Yes, if you ask for any, I didn't force the question for A or quad A. I just asked any. Any is not a type of resource. It's like a trump card. And I get back whatever there is for that name. And here I get, among other things, in the case of the signatures, the A and the quad A. I get this back. The query with any is not particularly reliable for the following reason. Theoretically, this has been a vector of attack and to a certain extent, a vector for mining the DNS information. So many authoritative servers disable the any query option. But this exists, and this is a case where you can see it in action. There is another question here, which are following. For DNS, do you need a new resolver? Well, not. Basically, all the software available today supports validation. I would say that any software written in the past 10 years supports validation. If the question, it's a common question. If this has to do with the performance and the memory, I would say not now. The servers today are really very uh, big. And in fact, in the next section, when we go into the practical aspects, we're going to see that with the same recursive server software, the same resolver, we'll be able to do configuration without DNS validation when, uh, without. So you don't need additional software because all the resolvers and all the server applications, which are commonly used, do support DNSSEC validation. Correct. Great. There is another question over here. Macarena is asking, Segal, how long does an address remain in the cache before you update the authority, before updating the authoritative service? Well, I realized I did have a slide, but I didn't mention this. The records, I stopped sharing the screen, sorry. We have a, a number here. When I ask just any registry, the DNS query, this number here, 7,200, that 7,200 is what we call the TTL. So this authoritative server is telling me for 7,200 seconds, don't ask me anything for this DNS key. And if I ask my re local recursive or anyone, let us ask, for example, Google. Everyone remembers this name of four eights. So I ask that, so if this, it says 7,199. And if I ask once again, it says 7,193. If I ask once again, 7189. So it goes down. If I ask a server that is not authoritative for this value, I get the answer from the cache. 
and this will expire when it reaches zero. When at a moment it will reach zero, and we'll go back to 7,200 because it will once again start asking. If I ask the authoritative one, I will always get back to 7,200 because the authoritative answer. So that is the role of TTL. And that was an excellent question, Macarena. Well, that was a mistake. I Macarena is part of the staff and she's assisting us with the question. It's not Macarena who was asking the question. She was just uh, re uh, conveying the question. The question was made by Gustavo Leon. So I'm sorry, that was my mistake. When I was asking HHH, I don't know if you realized at the moment, this number stopped going down. There it went down. You know why that is happening? Because 888 is not just one server. 888 is probably an Anycast service. So as I go on asking, and it's not the same one, then some might have it, others might not. So in order to I'm going to ask my recursive one at LACNIC. They ask if you can center your screen, please. What I was saying is 888 is not one single server, it's several servers. So when I do one query and another query, not all have the same vision of the TTL. If I repeat this experiment and ask in my local reserver here at LACNIC, 207.8.4.14, this is one that just has a few clients, it doesn't need to have do any cast, then I do have something which is predictable. Here we have 834. So believe me, what I'm going to tell you, if we are going to wait 832 more seconds, this will go back to 7,200. I'm not going to do that because we have a break now. But in fact, that is what would happen. Carlos, someone is asking whether for DNSSEC you need to obtain an RSA certificate. DNSSEC looks like an RPKI, RPKI, but it's not. It's a tree-like structure. It has keys, but it doesn't have a certificate. It doesn't have CRLs, for example. You don't need to create a certificate. You just need to sign the zone with keys that I generate, and then I have to go to the parent zone and ask to publish my record. This then largely depends on the registrar that works in the domains, or it is done in the MILACNIC portal of LACNIC through a mechanism that I can show you at the end of today's tutorial. Someone is asking that they're not so sure. The following topic, what would happen if I change the IP address and the TTL has not expired? Is this not translated properly? Well, there is one part that will continue being connected to the old IP. And this is a typical case of denial of service. In like Nick about a week ago, we did that, and in any precautions you take, you really have to know that this might happen. And this can be problematic in the following sense. The TTLs by default in many areas, for example, 86,400, this is a TTL that was quite common about 40 years ago. Normally, TTLs we use today are much shorter, but nevertheless, they could be of a couple of hours. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to do an operation, a service where the IP changes, then you have to take the pre following precautions. The previous day, you take away the TTL, 
and you change it. We, in our mail server, we lowered that to 300 seconds to all the relevant records, not all the zones, but only for the relevant ones. So we lowered that to 300. We did the operation, we changed the service, and at least five minutes later, the validation took place, and the following day, after we showed the migration had been done, the TTLs were returned to the original value, which is 7,200. Yes, you have to be careful with that. That's a typical cache problem. Is that or maintaining the old and the new IP addresses for a certain time? Yes. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Nicolas, for sharing the questions. Now we have a five minute break and we then we resume with the tutorial. Thank you, Macarena. Thank you again for being there. I remind you that you can have access to interpretation and to a transcription. If you want to see the latter, you need to downloaded from the webs our website. So now, Carlos and uh, Nicolás. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. In this second part, second and third of the tutorial, what we try to do with Carlos is to do uh, an exercise. It's a hands-on session. Carlos already discussed the theoretical parts and now the idea is that those of you who have downloaded the virtual box, as we instructed uh, in the mailing list, in the mailing, you may be able, you will be able to follow. So, and if you wish, so you can replicate the commands in your own uh, machine. If you have any questions or any questions you may have, whenever possible, do it through the Q&A, not in the chat, please, in the Q&A, because that is what we'll monitor. So please put your comments or questions there. If they are not questions, you may you may post them in the chat directly. So if you don't have access to the Q&A as an exception, you may ask in the chat, but we don't uh, guarantee that we'll be able to answer them because it's impossible to monitor the chat. I do my best to monitor all the channels. The, yes, the main channel is the Q&A. I'm going to try to share my screen the best way possible. Can you see it? I, I assume that's uh, the lab. Yes. Up here, I have the virtual box interface. If you have installed it, it you'll be able to execute it. And here I have the guide. Uh, we, we sent you a link so that you could download the guidelines and you can copy and paste the command so you won't have to write them all, especially some of them are rather lengthy, so it's easier to just copy and paste. So this is the virtual machine that we'll use during our practice. This is what we had sent you. 
Here I have the virtual machine. Right. So this is the virtual machine. It's executing. And what I did was to open a terminal from my own machine and to connect uh, via, via SSH to make it easier for me to copy and paste the commands. So let's follow the guideline so that you can all follow the practice. So you did this already, right? You installed the virtual box, you imported the virtual machine, and the user will have access to uh, the, the virtual machine is what appears when you execute the virtual boxer, and the password is uh, icon lab, icon lacoon. So there you have access as a user with no privilege. And here, the virtual machine, you see those commands. And you, you do your root, the password is the same, icon lab one. And there we are as the root users of the virtual machine. What I did was I connected through SSH to that virtual machine to make to ease up the execution of the commands. The first thing that we'll do before is going to the first step of installation in the guide, we're going to update, just in case, we're going to update the list of the packets that we can install in our virtual machine. So we use the apt get update, and this will synchronize the packets available depending on the window version that you have. So this will update it to the latest version. Now, the first thing, the virtual machine, the first, I'm going to show this here. I'm going to show another terminal here. This is another machine, and I'm just going to use it as a customer to send queries to the server where we are going to install our recursive uh, DNS uh, server. So I put IPRR to see the IP address in my machine. In my case, it's 10.0.1.34, but we're all going to have different IPs. So that will be the address of my recursive uh, record. I think it would be better to enlarge it, Nicolas. Too small? Yes, please. Yes, enlarge it still further. Is that okay? Yes, yes, that's that's much better. There. Sí. Queda cómodo a todos. Ahí está. Perfecto. There. Entonces les decía la dirección IP que so, tiene. The, the IP address of the machine that I'm going to use as a virtual machine to install the recursive is uh, the 10.0.34. I go to another terminal, just any. This is just to show that there are no No DNS servers running. I have no response. If I, I dig uh, to a Google, the Google server, to, the, to Google's public recursor, recursive, here you see if it's a Ubuntu OS machine, but it hasn't, it has nothing installed. 
So the first thing that we we'll do is to follow the guideline and to install the packages of the bind server. We're going to use bind as a recursive um, resource. Of course, there are many more servers that could be used to configure and to have a recursive server. So we're going to execute the first command. We will install the bind and we install the bind. We put apt get bind, bind, and here it asks, and we say, yes, it's installing the server. There, the server, the bind server is installed, and now we'll install the documentation of bind and some other DNS useful things. We execute the command, apt get install, And uh, so far, what we did is we installed the packets that we need for this part of the uh, hands-on exercise. Carlos, I don't know whether there are any questions in the Q&A. There are quite a number of questions regarding the virtual machine, but I answered these as we went along. Yes, the mail we sent on Friday had the guideline to install this but not the lab uh, guide this was published in the slide and now included it in the q a and i'm going to include it in the chat so you can download this and follow what nicolas is doing i was also asked if this was going to be recorded and available and we answered yes great all right so the first thing that we are going to do now before, uh, after we have the packets of the bind server already installed, is to test if this Ubuntu machine we have here normally has a firewall that is activated. So we're going to do, just in case, is to include a rule in the firewall the firewall is UFW. So we're going to include a rule there to allow traffic in the port 53 so that the firewall of the OS uh, does not block this. So the firewall is UFW allow port 53 and this updates the firewall rules in order to enable traffic to port 53, both for IPv4 and for IPv6 traffic. So now we're going to configure the server, the recursive server first. First of all, we're going to enable the recursive server in order to do recursiveness without validation of DNS sec. So we're going to do some tests here, and once this is operational, and then we're going to enable DNS sec validation by the recursive one, and we're going to then configure the one thing, something we call IP local, and we're going to explain with Carlos what this is and what the advantages are of this. And after we have configured it, we're going to do some tests, show you the advantages of this. So first of all, as I said, we are configuring the recursive server. The bind, once we install the bind packets, the directory, has it been modified? So it is there. That is the etc slash bind directory. We're going to switch to that directory. Uh, 
por algún motivo. Well, for some reason. It's not working. Just a second, please. Carlos, I might have installed it in a dozen directory. Carlos, in your version, is it installed in that one? Which one did you install? All right, let us try this. It's in the C. Oh, me está dando un, un error de... I get an error back, a connection error. Well, there is an interesting thing there that is happening. The name UI Archive Ubuntu is resolving this to IPv6, so maybe you're not installing the two packets. Well, this can be solved disabling IPv6 in the machine. So let's try to do this for all. IPv6, in fact, in theory, is not enabled. I think Mozilla does this. How could we disable this rapidly? Try IP minus six ADR flush. ADDR. ADDR. It's ADDR, not two R's. You have to put the name of the interface. In your case, if you don't have A, that's easy. It's strange. Clearly, this is defending the things you have in the internet and not having the CD. Okay, let's try to do something that is faster. Let's try and do an upgrade. No, no, the thing will have same thing will happen. It won't connect. I'll try it. Start editing the file ATC APT sources dot list, and I'm going to tell you. Let's try this out. Those are the things that happen when you go live. Yes, exactly. Well, let's see. Well, you have to change this. You have to go to ETC and edit that. ETC. APT. And see if there's a file called sources.list. And in sources.list, change UI and put US, and that will work. And then you do the upgrade. Which do I change? Or change UI for US. There is a trick where you someone can control your machine, but okay. Well, let me try and see if I can. Let's not do too much live experiments, experimenting. Okay, there it is. It should it should work with that.
Bueno, parece que el update por lo menos está haciendo lo de los so, the upgrade is being done from the new repository, so it might work now. Let's wait for the upgrade. There we are. There it is working. Okay. So let us go over it once again for all of you. In case the others are having the same problem. So what we did was to edit the file in the slash etc slash apt file, which is the file called sources list. And we changed the repository where it that was UI. I changed this for US for a repository, which I guess is in the United States. And then I did an APT update to update the entire list of packets. I installed it again. And in fact, it did work out finally. So now I'm going to install all the by 92 again in the Q&A some people in Argentina are having the same issue and because the dot r file has the same error so those in Argentina when you edit the source dot list file you will have a r and the repository name so change a r for us there are four lines where this comes up and save the file and do the up APT update and then try to install it again. All right, so now I repeated all the steps for installing this, for setting it up, a bind nine, the way it is in the guide, bind and dog and DNS utils, and then everything should be properly installed by now and the bind package should have been installed and we should have this directory slash etc slash bind so this is the content these are the contents of the bind directory any questions carlos that would like to react well i have been answering the questions already all right so let us now begin with the configuration of the bind server so that it can work as an authoritative server, although initially without DNS sec validation. All right. So before that, if you pay attention, if you look here, there is a file db.root. If we list the content of that file db.root, we see that this contains the IP addresses of the 12 instances of the root servers that I mentioned earlier today, or when Carlos, that Carlos mentioned the first part. So this file already contains the bind packet and the way a recursive server will have of finding the authoritative servers of the root, uh, of the root servers is in this step. If we didn't have that file, then our recursive server could not initiate this because they wouldn't have the IP servers of the roots. So this has the name assigned to each of the root servers from A through N, IPv4 address associated to the server, and the IPv6 address associated to this server here. This one here, server L, is the root server operated by ICANN. So this would be the IP4 address of the authoritative server and the IPv6 version of the root server. So what we're going to do now is to edit some of the bind configuration files in order to configure this as a recursive server. So the first file that we're going to edit in terms of the configuration is the directory in the slash rtc slash bind we're going to find one of the files which is a named dot conf dot options which is a bind configuration file that we are going to 
modifying and configure so that uh, we can operate as a recursive server. We're going to edit that file. I'm going to use the nano, but you can use the one you prefer. Also, Italian archivo name it. Let us edit the file named dot con dot options, and we're going to do some changes and additions in this file. First, let me explain what we're going to do, and then we will go about this. The changes we'll make are the ones you have in the guide. I'm going to comment on these before and what each of these configurations that we need is going to do. So to simplify this exercise, we're not going to enable this recursive server to respond through IPv6. We're, not, we're only going to use it in IPv4. This is for the purpose of simplifying the practical exercise. We're doing this remotely. We're not doing this face to face. And many of you might not have a provider that assigns you an IPv6 address. So in order to avoid problems and in order to avoid having to configure everything for IPv4 and for IPv6, then we're not going to use IPv6 for the purpose of this exercise as a recursive parameter. So this list line which says, listen to IPv6, we're going to we're not going to enable the recursive server to answer queries on IPv6. Then what we're going to do in this first part is use the recursive server with no uh, validation. The current versions of Bind, when you install them by default, they, the validation of DNSSEC is already enabled. So the idea is that first, uh, we see the practice and then explicitly what you'll do is to insert some lines in the configuration to disable the validation of DNSSEC. So we go to DNSSEC validation auto. You're going to see then what, does, uh, what that line does and we are going to enter a configuration line a row that disables DNSSEC. So DNSSEC, so you, you're you going to disable it. So this row, what does this row do? What does this line do? When we validate, when um, the DNSSEC is validated, the DNSSEC validation, in the case of BIND, when you put it in auto, what it will do is that BIND will be in charge of automatically Uh, keep the file of signatures corresponding to the root zone. We can, Carlos explained this in the first part. Basically, what we'll do, we won't need to download the public key of the root zone and the software will be in charge of doing it automatically with this command, if you put it in auto. So, I'm, and then manually, I can also download the information corresponding to the root zone, and I, I could do it manually, but this is much easier. So what I recommend is that if the software enables you to do it automatically. It's better to do it automatically. Of course, we can check. We, we won't do it now because it would take some time, but we can verify that the signature is the right one and we could download the M5 signature of that information, confirming that the file that I have is the right one and the information, the public key that I have is the correct one. So, the other thing that we'll do is to explicitly enable recursion. We're going to allow the server uh, 
but this is this is enabled by default but we are going to enter the command so that you may clearly know that we're going to enable recursion because we are going to install a recursive uh, server so it wouldn't make any sense to disable recursion so we're going to use this command I'm going to copy it from here from the guide to do it easier and finally what we'll do is use these two configuration lines so what they'll define is the IP addresses from which we are going to allow the queries to the recursive server. Typically, what I would put here is the address. Well, here you have the address of the local host. And you also have this range. In my case, the IP address that my machine has 10.01.34, that's my recursive server. That's 10.01.0.34. So I'm going to enable questions, queries from any client within this range of this prefix, because I have a, an address assigned with that prefix. And the same occurs in this configuration line. Basically, what this allows you to do is it the server can listen to in uh, uh, queries from here. So you can receive queries from any device, any client with a prefix assigned within those ranges. So we're going to copy those two configuration lines. In your case, you have to replace the uh, prefix uh, 10, 0, uh, Etc. Slash uh, 34 to your own. So you put IP ADDR in your, the virtual machine. The line of command of your virtual machine will give you your IP address, the mask, and then you'll know the prefix that you need to put instead of mine, because this applies only to my network. Carlos, I don't know whether you want to make any comments. So mine is 10.010.24. Yes, I'm being asked in the chat, what happens with IPv6 for them to listen to, IP, to version 6? Well, when you put listen over 6 there, you're going to listen to IPv6, and the yellow query is ruled by the same rules as IPv4. You have to add the prefixes for which you want recursion, etc. Yes, something that is important. No, go ahead. Something that I think is important to highlight and that we haven't done so far is that this practice is focused on a recursive and some things of the recursive because we tried to adapt it so that we would have enough time. But specifically, there are many issues of additional configuration details that you would need if you want to configure here we didn't mention all the security and uh, all the firework rules that is it's it's you shouldn't do it just uh, as it is here so these security measures that we put here are minimal but uh, they're far from all those that you have to use when you're going to operate with a recursive server. So, but summarizing what Carlos said, I would like the recursive server to be able to answer queries using IPv6. So I should leave this uh, line with no comments so that it can also listen to IPv6 versions and use uh, the appropriate configuration lines uh, enabling IPv6 for port uh, 53 and the queries for IPv4, as it is here. So that is uh, the configuration that we'll do so far. So let's recap. Just for the sake of this practice, we won't use IPv6, so we won't use this line. We disable the validation of DNSSEC explicitly, and we configure the two rules 
to enable queries from clients in the prefix or our specific network. And now we save the configuration. Ahí está. Simplemente listar el contenido del archivo para verificar que, que lo que. Lo there que you are. So. There is a command to check whether the configuration that we did has any mistakes. So you check uh, the bind configuration files, looking for errors, and if there are any errors, they report it. And if it doesn't send me anything, that's good news. No news, good news. At least this verification didn't find any errors, any semantic errors in the configuration file. So we uh, put the command named check. Conf, name check conf. It didn't send anything back. That means that uh, there were no errors were found when we checked. Now we start the bind server so that they will uh, consider the changes that we just made. So we use the service uh, command, bind nine, restart. Now we restarted our bind server. And what we do now, there, there we would have our bind server with no validation, a recursive server. With, without DNSSEC uh, validation, just using the IPv4 um, interface. What I do now, I go to the other window. Remember that I had the other window with my client. I'm going to expand this window so that you can see it better. And once again, I send a query, the same query that I had sent the recursive server, then I received no answers. Well, it's very fast. So I sent a question to the recursive server that uh, I just configured, and I have a response. And as I didn't ask any questions, what the recursive server sends me is what they know by default, that is in the uh, Answers section. Se, uh, section. It sends me the list of uh, the root servers. So what we'll do now is to check some things of what we've configured. We're going to use the dig command and ask the dig command and use some DNS queries. Nico, before you go on, Facundo Tannhauser asks whether uh, Nano is useful, uh, we, whether we usually use uh, Nano in Linux. Well, B is quite uh, cumbersome uh, because uh, it's like playing Mortal Kombat is using all your fingers and touching all the keys. But Indiana Jones would never edit uh, the files like this. Well, I'm not Indiana Jones. Well, you can use what whatever you want. I use Nano because I grew out of the bead. I no longer use it, but you may choose the one you want. So we are going to check some things and asking some queries to a recursive server from this terminal that acts as if it were the client. The first thing that we'll do, for instance, is um, we're going to ask a recursive server, for instance, for the A registry, www.com. I don't know whether Google responds differently depending on where you are in the world. 
In my case, it answers that the address that registry A is 172, 217, 172, 68. So it's our recursive is working right. We may ask the MX uh, registry, the lacnic.net. So I was asking our recursive server and the one that the client has configured, I still had to specify the server. So you put uh, dig at uh, the recursive server 10.01.34, then the query, and here you have the answer. This is the recursive that I just installed. You can also ask for the MX registry of LACNIC, LACNIC.net, MX. There. Carlos, could you check whether this is the right thing? Yes, it's correct. It's a name, it's not an address. And then in the additional session, section, they will return it. Uh, they will return an, a registry corresponding to the MX. So let us now do a query to a domain name that does not exist. So when I, this is interesting and also quite useful to do a deep question to a domain that does not exist. When you do a dig to a domain that does not exist, what I am doing is that I am ensuring that with the recursive caching, this answer will not be there unless someone at random would have written the same thing as I did here. That therefore the recursive server has to do the recursion and consult the root for that domain name. And because this domain name does not exist, the root server will answer that basically there will be no answer because that domain name does not exist. But I, with that, and looking at the answer, I will have an approximate idea of the time it takes to solve that query. And if you look at this here, the answer of the root server I did set the query to is that the domain name does not exist. So the status of the answer says non-existent domain. And if we look at this here, the query time, 468 milliseconds. Nico. They were asking me if you could raise your screen because in some zooms, they don't see the bottom part, the four or five last lines. I could see it, but apparently some people couldn't see it. So can you let us know in the chat if you can view it correctly? Yes. So as I said, when doing the dig through a non-existent domain, we force the recursive to consult the root. The root answers back that the domain does not exist with an X domain. And if we look at the query time, 468 milliseconds is the time it took to send the answer back. If I repeat the query, the time will drop yet further to one millisecond. This is because my recursive circuit already catched the answer. So my recursive server knows that this domain does not exist. So that millisecond is a time it takes to make the query and to get the answer back. This is very fast. If you allow me, Nico, I would like to add something. Remember when I spoke about the DNS tech registry and the denial of the authenticated, I don't know what. Okay, the myth here is that the negative answers to DNSSEC of non-existence are also answers and they are cached as well. And as such, they can also be abused. Therefore, 
denying existence should also be secured through some mechanism associated to DNSSEC. Now, remember, I spoke about DNSSEC in the context that I have records and registries and signatures of those. But when I get a flag of non-existence, when I have a negative answer, I have no registries that I, I, that I can sign. I have nothing to sign. So the DNSSEC introduces like a fiction so that I can sign it. When I get an answer, DNSSEC, a non-existence, I get an NSEC registry that I can sign so I can validate that non-existence. Nico, this is a time to have a 10 minute break so we can all grab a coffee. Yes, give me a second to answer a couple of, quest of queries, to do a couple of queries. We'll have, we'll have the break in five minutes, so we have five minutes before the break. But then we have another module, remember that. Yes, we have the break and then we can, we come back, we'll configure DNSSEC and we do the queries. Now, to add on to what Carlos was saying, here, as he was saying, this is a negative answer with a special answer of non-existent domain. Now, here, the flag, which was the AD that had been learned when this was an answer that was signed, the DNSSEC, this does not appear because it states that my recursive is not validating DNSSEC, it's not validating this answer here. Although, the root server, which I consulted, when I get this answer that this is non-existent domain, it signs this and confirms that it was the root that answered back that this domain did not exist, and I can be sure that this does not exist. So this was validated. But I'm not, I'm not validating DNSSEC when I'm controlling that. I just simply wanted you to see the time it takes. I changed the type of query, and the time, as it's not cached, it increased again to 103 milliseconds. But you see the major difference between 400 and 103 because that was the first DNS query I made. So the recursive maybe executed the mechanism it has to know which is a server, the authoritative server it keeps. And now it's consulting an authoritative server that is closer in terms of the network. So that is why this answer is so fast. All right, so the other thing that I wanted you to see, let's now look at, at this here. If we do a query, there is a, a site that these people have, and this is quite useful, at least, in order to verify the DNS sec. Basically, what this site does when I do the query, when I execute this query, which I'm going to write out now, if I do a query for the DNSSEC failed.org, what I will get back from this authoritative server is one that has been tuned for DNSSEC. So I'll get back an answer with a false signature. So in this case, remember that our recursive server does not have enabled the DNSSEC. So if I can do a query and I ask for solving the domain DNSSEC failed.org, the state of the answer is no error. And in fact, I'm getting back the A record associated to dnsfailed.org. My recursive server is not validating DNSSEC. Later on, we'll see how the people from dnsfailed.org on purpose included a false signature. So if I were to verify DNSSEC, this won't verify DNSSEC, but as I'm not doing it, I get an error. I don't get an error message because I'm not verifying this. So I get this A record back. So this is what Carlos was commenting on late earlier today. In normal conditions, this could very well be an answer from an attacker. If someone would have 
intercepted this, this answer it would have injected an IP address, which is not the IP address of the DNSSEC field.org, I wouldn't even find out. My client will think that this is the IP address associated to DNSSEC field.org, but in fact, it is not. This is precisely, I haven't enabled that, so I cannot validate whether the signature is correct or not. Right. So, Carlos, would you like to add anything before we go over to the break? No, just let me reinforce the concept that you mentioned. Incorrecta. The signature of that record is an invalid signature, and this is something that you should not see at all. You, if you see that, it's because you're not protected. So this is a type of test that you can carry out with your internet provider. If you can resolve that claim, it's because you're not protected from the type of attack that I mentioned in the first module. Yes, when we configure DNSSEC, we're going to execute the same query, and we'll see what we get back. We're going to see protection in action. Before we go over to the break, regarding what you mentioned of the cache poisoning attack. This will be satisfactory if I manage to figure out the sequence number of the UDP datagram and the port of origin and so on. So if I launch an attack and I find that number and that port, I could inject a false answer in the cache. And a, and a name can be solved with the address I want and not the real address. There is a mechanism which is far simpler in some cases and which is phishing. Imagine I'm an attacker and I register a domain name, legal and all the rest, and I set up my authoritative server for that domain name. And then I send a phishing email to a lot of people saying or announcing, access the site because there is a recipe to lose weight. You know, I've been at home for many months and I am sure that I'm fatter than before. So I might be, find that attractive, so I click on the link and I go to that site. If I click on the link and I go to that site, I'm going to make the query to my recursive server. My recursive server will end up making the query to the site, which is a real site, but set up by an attacker. And there, the attacker, one, they receive the DNS query, they have all the information they need. They don't even have to try and guess anything or the port. So instead of answering with that, they first answer with a domain that doesn't even exist, with a false IP address, then that's it. They already managed to poison the cache. So there are scenarios where as a result of actions that we as people take, we are deceived. And in many cases, we can realize it, but somehow we are facilitating the attack to an attacker, for example, cash poisoning. So this makes it far more attractive in the sense of enabling DNSSEC in the recursive server. So for those who manage recursive Service. So let's go over to the break and we can then continue with this thrilling topic. So when do we come back from the break? 10 minutes. We'll resume in 10 minutes time so you can have a coffee and then we'll go on with the final block of this tutorial. Thank you, Macarena. Ahí está. Se está viendo you see it? Can you see it? Yes, yes, we do. We, we see it. Thank you, Macarena. So, uh, let's recap what we said so far. Our recursive server is configured with no DNS uh, validation, but we had tests with the dig command. 
some uh, queries from uh, a client to our server. So what we'll do in the second part in this hands-on session, first of all, we are going to enable DNSSEC, our recursive server. After we execute that, we are, it's going to start validating from the NS, uh, DNSSEC. But we have to um, reconfigure the file that we had used earlier. I hope you see it now. So in our directory, installing bind, we're going to put again named comp options. I'm going to use the nano again. For those of you who love it, if you love bit, then you may not be very happy. What we'll do to enable DNSSEC is in this configuration line that we told you not to, uh, that we, we gave the command not to enable DNSSEC, now we we'll put yes, we delete the no, and we remove the comment in this line. Remember that it maintained the information automatically for the verification of the signature of the root. So just with those two lines, by changing those two lines, when we reboot the server, it should start validating DNSSEC. So let's save the new configuration. We'll check that the change was made and saved. We continue to use the command for checking configuration. This software doesn't detect any errors in the configuration file. It didn't send anything back. So apparently there are no semantic errors in the configuration file. So we'll reboot using the command service so that it will adopt the new configuration. There, the server was uh, rebooted. So now, if everything was reconfigured properly, we sh our server should validate the NSSEC. In order to check that, we are going to query NICBR, their authoritative server. I forgot to specify our server, our recursive server. This is the one that we're going to query. I'm going to query through using the NICBR domain name, and I'll add these two modifiers requesting the information back of the DNSSEC and this command, this multi is used so that the exit of this command may be more user friendly. I execute the command and here we see what Carlos said earlier. I have a, a flawless uh, response with no errors to the registry associated to NECBR and if you pay attention, the flag that the uh, response has been authenticated is um, uh, indeed is on. So NECBR assigned the registry of their zone using DNSSEC. And it's giving me back in the response session, it sends me back what I requested, the IP address associated with IP4 and associated with NECBR and the information that corresponds to the digital signature corresponding to that registry. This signature is what will verify my recursive when I need to validate using DNSSEC to see whether this response is correct or not. As a client, as I 
already received the response. That means that the validation was correct. Indeed, the recursive server received this information, validated this, and sent me okay. and sent me the response. So our server indeed is validating DNSSEC. Carlos, are there any questions? No, right now we don't have any questions. So what we'll do now is we, we may ask the same question that we asked uh, today with this DNSSEC uh, domain. Do you remember that today when we sent the query through DNSSEC, let's see, Earlier today, when we sent the query for DNSSEC uh, org, when we, we had sent this query when we hadn't enabled DNSSEC, and the answer was apparently correct. The IP associated to the DNSSEC fail.org answered because were, it was not validating DNSSEC. If now we if we ask it again now, notice that now the same query through this same domain sends me an error message back. This message, this error message is precisely because as we, we said earlier, the authoritative server sends me Registry, registry A associated to dnsecfailed.org and the electronic signature associated to that registry. When, the rec when my recursive server that I just uh, configured to validate DNSSEC tries to validate that signature, what they get precisely is that the hash of the electronic signature does not match the uh, Hash. So that is a, a validation error of the DNSSEC. So that is not the authoritative information. It's not the true information that was uh, generated for that domain. Here, it was done in purpose. But if this had been, for instance, a consequence of a poisoning of the cache and uh, somebody had inserted the domain and the signature and the wrong signature. When verifying this, uh, the recursive server would have shown me that there was an error. So as a client, I would be avoiding any uh, miss, um, uh, any answers that are not uh, validated. So here we can ask more queries, for instance, Let's go on with NEC BR. We can request for the rest of the registries of DNSSEC uh, registries associated to NEC BR, for instance, DNS key associated. There you have the DNS key registry associated to NEC BR domain. We can request the DS uh, registry associated to, to NECBR or RRSIG associated to NECBR. So here, here it is. Here you have the different registries associated to the various responses to the query of the uh, domain of Nicolas. There's something interesting here. Carlos, any comments so far? What I was going to show now is a tool that may be good to clear, especially when you start uh, experimenting the validation of DNSSEC. The, to see how we can explicitly insert an exception so that bind will not validate a certain domain. And it can be, what would happen, for instance, if somebody received a call, I manage the recursive server that we have just installed, and we receive a call from somebody 
operates a certain domain and they tell me that they are they have problems with the signature of their server as a matter of fact they maybe they forgot or they had a problem to produce the signature the old signature is no longer valid so all my clients are validating dnsec and that validation uh, uh an an error message appears and the clients can't have access to the website, not because of any attacks or poisoning of the cache, but just because the signature that the original server is sending is not the right one. So now I want to end up and for a moment to insert an exception to tell my recursive server that for a certain time not to validate a certain domain. So in bind, well, that depends on the DNS server that you use. But in the case of bind, you can't do that permanently. You see that we enter the command and by default, there will be some time um, of validity. Uh, and, and after that time, the server will try to validate it. And the, if the error was not fixed, then you again you receive a validation error message. So if I want to put another exception, for instance, if you want to validate with the, this domain DNSSEC, uh, this is the command that you have to enter in my server, in the recursive server. So using the RNC and RTA, the here. You have uh, RNDC NTA, and we, we're going to tell the server not to validate DNSSEC for fade.org for that domain. This NTA is the NTA, it's an exception to say to tell it not to validate it. And here, precisely, indeed, it tells me that I enabled the exception. Here, it tells me when the exception will expire. By default, if I, I can change the parameters, but uh, if I don't specify it, this will last an hour. In Uruguay, it's uh, 5.39 p.m., so up to 8, uh, 6.39 p.m. Any questions uh, made to this domain? My, re my uh, recursive search was validated, but now I'll go back to the client. Remember that we had uh, asked a question through dnsec.org and uh, we received uh, an error because the signature is incorrect. I ask uh, a query again, and now, indeed, I have no errors. And that is because I entered the exception. So although my recursive um, server is validating dnsec for this, specific domain, I told him not to do it, so he cannot verify it. And indeed, the message, uh, he sends me the information that he obtained that in this case is the address for IP before. When this exception that I put in this server um, um, uh, loses validity after uh, 6.39, you, you uh, um receive the um the answer i think that the maximum that you can uh invalidate is is from one hour to a week if you need more time because you couldn't solve the problem that would not be a, a very common situation you should be able to solve it in a few hours or days but if, if you haven't been able to solve it you have to extend it before the previous uh, exception uh, uh, finishes. So here I leave you the command in case you wish to list the exceptions configured. The command, if you do rndc nta minus dump, it shows the configurations and when it uh, um, loses validity. So 
if I put the exception and I add the modifier minus lifetime and space and the duration, I can change the duration up to a maximum of one week. And there are also commands. I didn't show it here, but there are commands to eliminate the exception before it uh, um, gets obsolete. I should be able to eliminate the exception in uh, before a week. So far then, that is the way you can enable DNSSEC in a recursive server. And what we'll do now, unless there are any questions, the link local. I think that that was a very good review of the concept of DNSSEC in a recursive, the validation of in a recursive, that I think that for most people, it's the most important part, is what is going to enable you to protect your networks and your users of potential internet attacks. So I think that it's good to go to the local so that we can start wrapping up. Here, this is a, a, another query for, for LACNIC.net. Here we have the signature, here I have the response of IPv4 in A, the registry A, and uh, the digital signature. Just to show you some other DNS queries and the information of DNSSEC associated. We have another question, Carlos. Um, Nicolás. Where can we get the guidance that you have there or, or a similar? Uh, well, the idea is that after the tutorial in the calendar, just as all the other presentations, we're going to post it. We're going to post the presentation, the PDF of, the, uh, of Carlos' uh, presentation and the lab guide. So you'll be able to repeat this at home. Well, anyway, we shared the link several times in uh, the chat. I can't do it again, but it's going to be an additional material that will be available to you. I don't have the link at hand. So that's why I can't put it again. Good. But. So the idea now um, to finish the practice we're going to see a topic that is not directly related with DNSSEC. It has nothing to do with DNSSEC, but it has to do with DNS, and it's part of what we wanted to show today. Do you remember that today, earlier today, I made a query from our server, from the client to our server, our recursive server that I, I had just configured with the domain, and I'm going to ask another query from a non-existing domain. And do you remember that there we saw, uh, I, I sent a query to the, um, and uh, the um, uh, recursive uh, domain uh, server will send it to the, uh, um, and it will tell me that doesn't exist. And you see the time of the response. La, la raíz en so that's the time the root took to answer that that domain did not exist. The zone file for the root zone does not exist. They don't have a domain name like this here. And all the query time was about 396 milliseconds. It, it, in terms of internet, it's our whole lifetime. <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably it's a long time. And I have query times of 100 and some milliseconds. Now it's impressively high. Now, there is where we have the IP local. Now, before going over that, 
let me explain further. When we speak about the DNS resolution, and particularly that of recurs recursion, the first step is that my recursive server, once it receives the query from the client, the first thing it does is to ask for the root. For example, if I ask which is the A record of nicolasantonillo.com, the server, the recursive server is going to ask the root. The root will not have the answer because it's not authoritative for nicolasantonillo.com, but I'll, it will answer the name of the authoritative servers of the .com. So the root has basically records of the NS associated to the authoritative service of all these domains at this level. So if I could maintain a local copy of the root of all the root zones, in other words, in my recursive server to maintain a copy of all the root servers, then my recursive server would be the first step. It would first do the query to the root, and it could skip this because instead of doing the query to some of the servers of the root server of the 13 announced addresses, it would directly do the query to the local file where they have a copy of all the root zones that would be much faster less than one millisecond so that is what we call ip local ip local is a term that was designed i think it's david crocker the author of ip local so it's maintaining in the recursive server a copy of the root server. So there are servers that make available the root server. And I can configure my recursive server using the zone transfer protocol, the same that is used for transferring the zone from an authoritative holder to a copy of an authoritative one. So this is using XFR, and I can transfer this from certain servers and then store the root server in my recursive server. And the more recent versions of the recursive servers, such as Bind, have evolved in such a way that, the, firstly, the configuration is far easier in some cases, it will be just one line. I enabled it. So we're going to see that for the version we have. We're going to do a configuration of a couple of more lines, but it's not very complicated. And then with that configuration, that by default, once a day, it will contact some of these servers that make the zone available and use the XFR standardized protocol in order to transfer the root zone and will file it as a local root server. So initially, it won't ask the other root servers, but it will consult the local server. In other words, a local file is kept of all the root zones. So that's what we're going to configure now in our server and i'm going to repeat this query with a domain that does not exist to see how the query time varies my recursive server will not go out to do the query elsewhere but will check with my root uh, file so this time should drop drastically now to configure the ip local we're going to edit the file named, named .com options, named .com options, and we're going to enter the next configuration. Let us go over it first, and we can then configure it. So, as I said, we're going to edit the file. I think I said I mentioned the incorrect file. 
I'm sorry. So let us do the following. With the bind version we have here, we have to edit two files, the name.com options and also the named.conf. So first we'll edit the named.conf options file and we're going to simplify this. We're going to mention this issue of the recursiveness because that will be done in the other file, the named.conf. So the named.conf.options will be edited now. And we comment the line associated to the recursiveness. This issue of how to configure the epilocal depends on the bind version that we have installed. If you go to the RFC of IP local, the RFC 7706 is the RFC containing all the hyper local information. After specifying the call and the protocol, it has examples and shows you how to configure this in different versions of the recursive, most common recursive servers in different bind versions and different versions of unbound as well as other types of service and particularly if you look up this rfc and how to configure these examples as you advance in the more recent versions of the recursive service the way to configure this is very simple in the more recent versions it's uh, just a couple of lines the one we have is a bit longer i recommend to look up the version you have go to the rfc and check whether there's a version that is simpler than the one we are using now now we're going to create two views one for the root and one for the resolutions and we're then going to edit the recursive part and then to at the root view instead of doing the query to one of the servers of the root zone we tell it that it has to do the query with the local information that was copied using this option so first we edit the file named.conf.options in this line of the recursiveness. And then we're going to edit the other file named.com. The named.conf. And we see that by default, it has just these few lines. And what we're going to do now All right, named.conf.options and named.conf.local, these two configuration lines we will continue using. And what we're going to, what we're going to change now is to comment the configuration line that has to do with the zones, particularly the root zones. We're not going to use this file. So we're now going to do the configuration so that we generate a local copy of the root zones. So with that aim, as we have here in the guide, we do to create a view for the root zone. Let me first copy and then I will comment on each of these things that I've just done. So what we're going to do is to indicate a series of servers from which we can obtain the copy of the root server, particularly these two here are two servers that I can has and are exclusively dedicated to making available publicly the root server to any who wishes to configure this local locally 
and then transfer this to the root zone. So any of these sites can be, I can transfer the root zone to any of these sites here. So through this view, what I am doing is generating a local copy of the root zone and storing it in this file here of the root zone. In the root zone dot VD, we'll then store the copy of the root zone. And after that, we're going to create another view in order to answer all the other recursive queries that are not done through for domains based on this route. So this is the same configuration we had earlier in the other configuration file in the named.conf dot options. So we now have to create a specific view. Here we enable the recursive aspect. Here we enable the recursion. Bear in mind that the configuration to enable recursion from which client am I going to allow queries and that recursion? So I have to include the IP range. I have to modify this with a prefix that you use. Otherwise, it won't work. So compared to the manual, the only change is that here you have to put the prefix of your own networks. And in this case, the generic view states that in order to solve the root zone, we will use the local root zone copy that I created in this old, uh, part here. It will look this up in the root zone and then do the query to the corresponding authoritative servers. So we save the configuration. There we saved the configuration and we will then verify that there are no errors in the configuration file. I checked this, there are no errors in the configuration file. So we'll now restart the bind. There we restarted the bind server. And if everything is fine, when I restart it, the recursive server should have already then gone to all one of those servers that kept a copy of the root zone. To go one of the servers that kept a copy of the root zones, the ones that we can, whose file we considered named.conf, and then this is stored in a local file, rootzone.db. Specifically, if you want to check that indeed this file was created, rootzone.db with slash var slash cache, cache, that's, that's the where the file is going to be saved. This file, rootzone.db, was generated when I created uh, the uh, rootzone, and it's not so big. The size of the file contains all the information of the rootzone, but it is not so large. Nico, I'm asked, and I, I have the same question. Casares asks, how regularly how frequently and how do you update the copy of your root zone? Because this is not just uh, any secondary. You don't receive uh, the any notifications telling that the zone changed. So, so how frequently would you do it? Yes, uh, as I understand, once a day by default, but you can change it once a day, 
the bind, my uh, recursive uh, server, my bind, checks the uh, root zone and see whether it matches the local copy. If it matches, it doesn't do anything. And if it doesn't, as in any zone transfer, if it detects that the zone file of the uh, of the root zone has changed, it replaces it. Now, for this bind, uh, for, for this one, it's just one day, but I can change it. The root zone is not something that changes every day. So by checking it once a day, that should be more than enough. The root zone should change. Of course, when you create a new top level domain or one, there is a rotation of some of the DNSSEC keys. But it's not something that should happen too often. And even there's even a command to which I can force the uh, checking and updating it. So I can do this. Uh, restart the bind, the, the bind. So the, so it will check and it will update the copy if it's not updated. So if you want to be absolutely sure, you restart the bind and then it will keep the copy. I don't remember now what the command is, but there is a command to force the update without a need to restart the server. Restarting the bind is less than two seconds. It's nothing. Theoretically, you shouldn't restart a server to force an update, but you should use the proper command. I look for it later and I can send it to you. Carlos, does this answer your question? Of course it does. I, yes, I was thinking of the same. What I don't remember now is whether for the new versions of Bind that period changes, but in the case of Album, this is not configured the same and you have to configure it a little bit differently. And if I'm not wrong, you have to specify how frequently and you configure the hyperlocal, then you have to tell it uh, the system how often you want checking. And I don't remember how much it is by default. So the less, last versions of Bind specifically, the configuration is much easier to enable hyperlocal. I think it's two to three lines. You don't even have to specify the list of the servers that uh, make the root zone available because it already brings a list of the distribution devices. So the configuration basically is just enabling hyperlocal and that's all. That would be the ideal if I want to avoid hyperlocal to just use a command. If I know what it is, it shouldn't be so difficult. And that task should be simplified by the developers of the server. So what we'll do now to verify all this, to see that I'm not lying all the time lying, we are going to do a query again from the client, my recursive server. Now I have validation of the NSF and a, cop a local copy of the zone. And so I'm going to send a query from a non-existent domain. So now it won't go, the recursive server won't go to the root server, but should look, check in root.db, the local copy of the root zone. And with that, I should realize that uh, that doesn't exist. Now, if you look at this, the time of response, five milliseconds. We were in 300 milliseconds. And now, five milliseconds, that time, those milliseconds were or the time that the client went to my recursive, my recursive checked so that the domain didn't exist and answered. So by using hyperlocal, the great advantage here is that the latency gets significantly reduced, hugely reduced. 
So if I reduce the, uh, the time, the, the user's experience when entering a URL and when the, and the website gets starts deployed, uh, improves significantly. So this, this is uh, really, it has the same advantages of promoting the installation of copies of uh, the root service. But of course, the root service increases the resilience of the domain uh, uh, system. And the uh, hyperlocal is not as reliable as going and asking an authoritative uh, author because this is a, a local copy. Now we won't enter in the, uh, in the cases, but for some reason I may be losing connectivity with the servers that have the copy. So what happens if my local recursive server uh, sends a query but it gets no answer? It's not that they look at the series and the, I can't reach the servers through which transfer this. So what the server probably, the recursive server probably would do if it keeps trying and gets no answer, it quits using the hyperlocal configuration and goes back to the previous case, that is goes and asks a root server because it should invalidate the local copy that I have for hyperlocal, but that needs to be configured too. So it's not exactly the same not exactly the same as having a copy of a, a root server closer, but it's a con an additional configuration. So, and this improves notoriously the waiting time and the time of resolution of the entire domain. I wanted to add something that is hyperlocal is quite a recent phenomenon. It's becoming increasingly popular and it acts on a very important thing of the in structure of infrastructure of DNS. Accessing the root is sort of the foundation that all the rest works. So being able to access the root in a reliable way and with a very, very good platform is of key importance. Something that I was just Thing is that there are cases where the hyperlocal technique can be used for other zones that are not the root zone and it may have an interesting ap application, but I, I won't say it because I wanted to make a new presentation for future events. No, well, yes, this configuration that we did here when we generated the, the way we see it, this view, you can generate it for any zone. I could have a copy of all those zones that, that the zones make publicly available. It's not that just any, I can do it with any, because I need to be able to bring the zone. So, uh, if the the administrator makes the zone available, as uh, Carlos said, I could have a local copy, not just of the root, but potentially of a number of zones. Yes, of course, I imagine that it has many, many potential uses. For instance, for private zones, not public zones. In a company, for instance, in a corporation, a global, corporation and if they have a private name or resolution, they could keep a local copy of that zone to solve it quickly. Or in many other cases where they have a zone that is used a lot, probably a Google or Cloudflare or many of those may maintain local copies, not just of the root zone, but of many zones that are uh, queried often to reduce the burden because for the recursive server, this is, it's, it's burdensome to, if they can uh, consult it with the, the local file, it won't have to work so much. 
I don't know whether there are any more questions. So what we wanted to show today is something that you can do with your machine, how to enable DNSSEC, how to configure hyperlocal. And the idea is that in the remaining time, we may use it partly to answer the questions that you may have concerning today's tutorial. Bueno, Nico, excelente. Creo que salió super bien. Eh, Nico, pasó. that was excellent. Well, we had a funny thing with the registry. Uh, well, that's what happens with it. Yes, it's more interesting. They realized that this was real. Well, you didn't see it, but I got a bit nervous. Well, in today's world, you never know. I have a question and I'll read it. Juanjo asked, can you manage DNS in a decentralized manner? I don't know whether the term, term is right. May I have local DNSs in different subnets with common domains? I don't know whether I understood the question. So that is that you could have common domains and different subnets. If the DNS can be managed decentralized, um, well, I, I don't understand the rest of the question, but my answer, I would be tempted to say, yes, you can, Juanjo. It is, was designed so that you can manage it in a decentralized manner. That is, as a matter of fact, there are agencies that manage the root zone. There are 12 different uh, agencies that manage the different uh, zones and each organization that buys the uh, uh, exclusive use rights, buys a domain, they can run their own authoritative and manage their own zone for their own domains. So from that point of view, the answer, I would dare say it's yes, always, because the DNS was created as a decentralized system and decentralized administration. So it's not just that it's only in one place, but it's managed from uh, many different places. No, I didn't understand it either, but one of the principles of designing the DNS is that each uh, organization may have its own pages in the internet book of the directory and that is a way of decentralizing many people say that dns is decentralized because uh, it is a, a, a tree um, well it is centralized and decentralized because i have a degree of decentral decentralization such that each organization may have its pages where they can write their registries so the design already has, it incorporates many good things of different worlds, but as all the design decisions, it has trade-offs. But I think that the design has survived 40 years, so kudos. If you have any other questions, Luciano Minucci says, I think that the administration is always centralized and uh, the administration is decentralized. Well, indeed, the authority is delegated, is divided into a number of servers. So it's a bit centralized, a bit decentralized, but it is also true that the registers are configured in one in the primary. So in that sense, it is centralized. Well, it's a debate that I don't know whether, well, when, when I said decentralized administration and centralized management, I refer to all the domain system. ICANN is in charge of managing the root server and the Operation is decentralized because there are several operators who operate, but the root zone is just one, 
and all those who operate, operate an identical copy. But if we think of the DNS as a whole, each one who, each person who has a domain can manage and have their own domain without having another entity or telling us how they should be done. Yes, it's that. Yes, I was referring to the DNS as a whole. Yes, correct. All right. So at this moment, we have no more questions. Well, Luciano says, yes, in fact, that is what I was referring to. Thanks, Nico and Carlos. Well, there are no more questions, and we are past about 10 minutes. So we now give the floor back to Macarena. And that would be all. Macarena and Carlos. I don't know if we can do this, but is there some way in which we can ask those who are following us how many of them tried to follow the practice together with us so as to tap this? If we had thought of this before, we could have done a poll. Well, maybe you can include this in the chat. Try and raise your hands. Let's see if you raise your hand. Raise your hand, those of you who followed the practice. 9, 12, 14, 18, 21, 25, 6, 26, and there it is. So about 30 out of 150. Great, thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Carlos. And thanks to all of you, those participants who have been followed us throughout the entire day. I hope you had a good time. But the event is only starting, so we look forward to meeting you at 14 UTC, a day that will be full of activities. We will have the op official opening of the event, the Lifetime Achievement Award, and our keynote speaker, Kimberly Claffey, better known as KC, who is a member of the Internet Hall of Fame and our expected public policy forum group. We see you tomorrow. Macarena, let me make a comment. We thought, if we had time, to organize a Kahoot, like a game with all the participants before they leave. But I don't know if that was prepared or not. A Kahoot as part of the tutorial. Do you have it there? If it's ready, you can have those minutes. Yes, I have to. I think Ariel has it ready. And that's better, because in that way, Ariel cannot participate, so he cannot win the Kahoot. So you have the floor then. So I'm upgrading him. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Macarena, for changing the agenda. Hola, Ariel. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Cómo estás, Ariel? There's going to be no translation of the Kahoot. So, goodbye. Con un Kahoot sobre esto de DNS que preparó. Quiero aclarar que este es un Kahoot que no tiene sponsor, o sea que no hay premio, salvo el orgullo de ganar, que es premio suficiente para todos ustedes, yo lo sé. No sé si no, seguro, a ver. Adelante, Ariel. Adelante, Ariel.